Hi, everybody. I'm Kat, and this is Kat's Coffee Talks, where I talk with um, artists and musicians and thespians and writers and all kinds of people that are highly creative in the community. And also, I've got some national recognized artists coming on later in the month. So um, we're here this morning with Karen Mobley, who I have admired and respected for years and years and years. And I'm very excited that she is our first guest. And we're going to uh, congratulate her, first of all, because she's had some great success and just had a wonderful exhibit that I would love for her to tell us all about. How are you doing this morning? Good morning. It's nice to see you. And it's good to be here. I feel almost like we're in the same room, even though we're... I Zoom. Um, anyway, it's good to be here. Well, I'm grateful for Zoom. I can't imagine what you know people in the past have gone through when they've been quarantined, like the Spanish flu, and that we're very fortunate that we do have um, you know technology to keep in touch. And it does. I, I've missed you so much. I um, I have fond memories of hanging out in your house and in your backyard, and um, just years of uh, great times talking about some really important things in the community. So I just want to start off by saying, Karen, um, how, how long ago did you move to Spokane? 23 years ago in March. Gosh, that doesn't seem possible. I know. So, <laughs> wow. So when she moved into town, um, you know, I, I was born and, and raised here and I've been in the arts my whole life. My father and grandfather and aunts and uncles and cousins all in the arts. And so I thought I knew everybody until I met Karen and she had within two weeks known more people that were involved in the arts than I had ever known my entire life. She introduced me actually to some really fabulous people. And um, so right off the bat, I had great admiration for her. And then when I got to see her work and hear her, her poetry, um, I was uh, deeply uh, impressed and moved um, by her skills, her talent, and her personal story. So we're going to start by asking Karen. Um, congratulations. Thank and you. I want to know uh, what you've been up to. I, I know you recently had an exhibit. We need to hear about that. Well, I just finished up an exhibit that I had at the Moses Lake Museum and Art Center, which is in Moses Lake, Washington, which is about an hour and a half from Spokane. And it is a big body of work, mostly that relate to skies and water. There were drawings, oil paintings, um, some very large installation drawings. I showed some of the big drawings that were in window dressing and that had been in the big terrain show. And that was pretty fun. It was up from October until this week. Um, like a lot of things during COVID, it was open and then it was closed and then it was open again and then it was by appointment. Um, it came out to be a really nice show, and I think that there were a lot of people who went to see it. Um, many friends from Spokane drove over to Moses Lake, and they were, the staff at the Moses Lake Museum was pretty impressed with how many visitors they had, considering all of what's going on right now. I saw some of the reviews on, on social media, and everyone was raving about it, and I wish I had gotten over to see it. I've been um, quite quarantined. Mm -hmm. so, some uh, of the reviews. Yeah, but um, is, that's one of your pieces that's behind you right now, correct? Um, yeah, it is one of the pieces that, that's one of the water pieces that's behind me right now. And um, Gorgeous. Yeah. Um, anyway, so that was, that was one thing that's been happening. The other thing that's happening is I'm getting ready for a show at the terrain space in the Washington Cracker Building, which will be in April. And that's a show I'm doing with Deb Sheldon and Rosemary Burrell. And we'll be installing our work. Um, we're calling the show Rising Above. And awesome. um, a little bit of a response to the COVID shutdown. We've been, we're, all of us have been working and been really actively um, participating in what we're doing. Um, I feel like um, it's gonna be a great opportunity to show some of the things that we've been working on while things are shut down. And I've been painting a lot and Rosemary's been making sculpture and Deb has been making some new work. So I think we'll have a good time. And um, anyway, it'll be interesting to see how we do. Uh, we 
kind of, you know, submitted for a different idea, like in 2019. And with the shutdown, a lot of things got switched up and changed around. And I don't know, that sort of seems to be the way it is. We just kind of have to, you know, surf along the top of the tide here while we're working right. with all the other things. Have you found that your work has changed at all through this pandemic? Well, I think the main thing is that especially over the first part of the pandemic, I knew that the things that I had been scheduling, a lot of them were canceled. And so I started working on these smaller doodle paintings, which I probably will show at the terrain show. And my goal was just to mix it up and do a lot of small work really quickly so that I stayed, I don't know, in sort of a creative mode I also didn't want to invest huge resources in doing large work that I didn't have a location for. So, right. you know, I started and I did about, I don't know how many of them, there's more than a hundred small paintings that I did over the last year. And they're pretty small. Most of them are nine by 12 or 11 by 14. And a lot of them are just watercolor on yapo paper. So they're like an hour or two into each of them. Um, it's not like that. It isn't a lot of work, but it's different than making larger pieces. And I've also done some larger pictures during that time, but I did a lot of experimenting with different color. I kind of made a rule, which I wasn't going to buy any materials. So I um, started working with a lot of different colors than I normally do because I had more of that. And that's actually a pretty good exercise because if you all of a sudden you're starting to work with a lot of red and purple and you've been mostly working with earth tones and pale um, soft blues and other things, it really forces you to think about the color and the subject matter differently. Well, and that leads me to um, a comment that I wanted an observation about your work that um, you have a lot of black and white with a lot of depth and contrast and form. Uh, and and even things that are without form that are more just ethereal and linear. And, and then you started adding some blues, although I do have a platter that has some bright yellows and bright blues and turquoise mm -hmm. and different blues that I just love that platter that you did. Um, but I noticed uh, through social media that some of these small, what you call doodles. You call yeah, I'm them calling them doodles. doodles. Yeah. Um, they had a lot of vibrant colors in them. And I've been in your home and your home is filled with a lot of vibrant colors. You have quite an impressive collection of other people's work as well as your own hanging. And um, you've got kind of the South, you know, West vibe going on there with these bright colors. And so it was interesting to see the impact of, um, well, now I understand that it's from your uh, self-discipline of not buying art supplies during COVID, <laughs> but that uh, <laughs> I just thought, well, she's, you know, COVID has affected her and brought more color into her work. And I was very curious about that. So thank you for explaining that. That's, that's really uh, interesting, fascinating. Well, and some of what I've been doing is um, based on observations, like a lot of the pictures I did over the summer, the inspiration was my garden, which is very colorful. Oh and I have a really a really big flower garden in my front yard so yes. I was responding to things like the poppies and the African daisies and those other things that grow there that are really vibrant and bright and I also kind of did a little bit of the thing that I think oftentimes you do in the summer which is I've been doing walks and little outdoor adventures and that's provided a little bit of stimulation for new work um, Sure. Well, you, I respect your gardening skills. You seem to have a great depth of knowledge. It kind of reminds me of the story you told once about your mother knowing, and in fact, I think you wrote a poem about it, um, brown bird to brown bird, that she knew mm -hmm. all the brown birds. And every time I see brown birds and I'm like, Karen's mother would know what kind of bird that is. <laughs> and, and I think you have uh, inherited her ability to decipher uh, different species of things, and especially when it comes to uh, flowers, you are mm -hmm. a, a person that what I I would go to and say. Uh, in fact, I've seen you ju jump in and say, "Oh, I know what that is." Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's really great to see that um, being expressed in your work. Now, Karen, um, you started making art like yeah, like me, just right at the get go when you were a kid, correct? Yes, I've been making stuff since I was very small. Um, right. And when did you um, 
first have that understanding that you were an artist, that you were born an artist? Because I know adults, like I've had students that, that I, I just, you know, I would call them an, or introduce them as an artist. And they're like, oh, I'm not an artist. Like it's, I just called them a goddess. And I'm like, no, it's like, you just know. When did you know? Well, I think when I was a little kid, I knew that I would be doing some kind of creative thing. And I, I don't think I started out to be a painter necessarily, which I've mostly turned out to be a drawer and a writer. Um, when I was a kid, probably like a lot of kids, I was always building stuff. So I might be know, building a fort or making a puppet or make, making a doll or sewing something or making a little book. Um, my mom, um, we grew up way out in the country in Wyoming. My mom always got materials so that we would have things to do. And I think that she and my dad were both a pretty big influence on the fact that my brother and I both became artists. And some of that was just making stuff available to us so that Absolutely. we have things to work with. Um, I also think growing up in a fairly isolated area without, um, I don't know what we would call it, sort of normal kid stuff. Like we, we were way out in the country, so we didn't do stuff like play softball or something like that because it would require driving such a long distance. So, you know, I think that being self-motivated and self-generating with our entertainment and, you know, having the opportunity to mess around with different materials. And my dad liked to draw. My mom did a lot of, she wasn't really an artist, but she did craft things and she was a really good cook. And she did a lot of things that homemakers of her generation did, made curtains and made quilts and sewed our clothes and those kinds of things. So right. it was around us. Well, that just confirms what I tell parents of uh, my young students is if you keep them supplied, if they have the passion and the interest that they'll go ahead and, and just, uh, yeah, and they, you know, children don't even need much, you know, they just yeah. will go for it. My mom just, would buy big giant packages of typing paper, like 500 sheets at a time, and we could use as much paper as we wanted to. Um, and, you know, it wasn't expensive. We had lots of pencils and watercolors and stuff that we could mess around with. We'd get in trouble for um, stealing the glue and the woodworking supplies from my dad because we're always building stuff. And, you know, how kids are with Elmer's glue, right? You use right. a couple of quarts of Elmer's glue, gluing, it, gluing a right. bunch of sticks together or whatever you might do. Right. Well, I have a five-year-old that I'm giving art lessons to every Friday and today's Friday. So I'll be, well, it'll be, this will be posted on Tuesday. No, today's Tuesday. So Friday. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's just, uh, it's so much fun to watch kids and to think about, you know, ourselves when we first got started and all the wonder and, and, and the freedom and the lack of, you know, just, we were not self-conscious at all. What, uh, what experience do you remember um, about maybe selling your work early on when that started happening? Hmm, that's kind of an interesting one because when I was really young, I didn't really try to sell my work, but I did do things like enter pictures in the county fair or enter sculpture in the county fair. Um, I got ribbons at the county fair, like in fourth and fifth grade. Um, we didn't have a lot of places as kids to show art when I was a kid, but we certainly did do some things where we um, took art, I don't know, like to community events, like in Girl Scouts. We, I remember at one point we had some kind of I don't know what you would call it, like a festival or an event where everyone put up their pictures and did that kind of stuff. I didn't really right. start trying to sell my work until I was in college. And then I was starting to have shows, you know, and the, probably like a lot of people, my first shows were in places like bookstores and restaurants and cafes, uh, cafes, different kinds yeah. of places. Um, I started having gallery shows 
well, probably in the early 80s. Okay. Uh, and before, between undergrad and graduate school, I started doing a fair amount of, a fair amount of exhibiting. I noticed the cat has managed to open the door. <laughs> now you're starting to fade in and out of your background there. Um, it's okay. Mine's hiding under the covers right now. I, yeah, she's usually trying to get in the show. Um, yeah, so I see that you recently sold one of your charcoals. It was a beautiful piece. Yeah, it, um, I sold a drawing to one of my old neighbors um, who bought it for her 65th birthday as a birthday present for herself. And um, I've actually been surprised how well I've done during the COVID shutdown with sales. Uh, I attribute that mostly, to be honest with you, to social media, because I'm posting things as I'm making them on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, and even though um, it doesn't always work. A lot of times somebody will see something and then they'll ask to come over and see it on the porch. I haven't been letting people in the house um, because of COVID. I've been being very right. Right. I actually was contacted by a psychiatrist out of Seattle and, and did the deal out in the front yard. Yeah, that's <laughs> and the it's just like where everybody's masked and stuff. I thought, okay, this is a new reality. Yeah. Well, um, congratulations is a beautiful piece. And yeah. so um, what, uh, where do you see your work uh, going? Do you have like a vision for a, a new series or? Um... Well, I'm working on a proposal which hasn't yet been accepted for a museum in Montana. And they oh, have be lovely. a big giant atrium in their building. And I've been trying to figure out a way to build a three-story drawing in sections. So wow. I've been messing around with that and looking at different kinds of paper and different ways to attach. And so I've been kind of messing around with that. And I really like working on the large pieces, but you have to have the right location for it, right? You know, and yes. most yeah. of those big things I'm making, you know, I don't really have like a, a, a good local venue for them. Um, right. So I don't know, I'm just kind of working along and I'm imagining as things start to reopen after the COVID shutdown, that there'll be opportunities that maybe I don't have right now. A lot of times what happens is I think I'm doing one thing and then something else appears, which is the way life really works most of the time. That's very true. You, you need to be flexible and pivot, as they say. So um, I don't think that people uh, who are not um, makers of art understand how uh, one can, uh, can really be influenced by the walls that they, they're filling, you know, that it, it really does have an impact on you think, oh, I have that one space. I could fill that with this. And that will change the direct the direction of whatever series you might be working on, at least in my case. In terms of scale, it really makes a difference because absolutely, you're, if you have an opportunity to make something in a bigger space, then you might. Um, and if you're showing, I don't know, like in a small gallery space or, you know, even like the things that I might make if we're having a studio sale or something, a lot of times that work is smaller, partly yeah. because of the scale, but it also depends a little bit on the audience of what you're expecting to be there. Because, you know, if you're doing something in a venue, I mean, a good example would be I've been participating at the art school every year in the Yuletide. Well, in Yuletide, everything basically is geared towards being a gift or a right. small, you know, a small present. So everything's small and everything tends to be at a lower price point. Sure. I made a whole bunch of little tiny paintings that are three by four inches right before Christmas. I haven't made anything that small in a long time, but it was fun to do. And, you know, I had a specific place for it to go. So I had a reason to be working that small. That makes perfect sense. And also the, um, the ability to, to get a step away from the wall if the gallery space, I um, mean, we have a local gallery here that you can't really step away because the, the walls are so close together. So that would really impact like some, I've heard some artists say, I, you need to view my work from at least 10 feet away, you know, to really get the impact 
of uh, what's going on in it. And um, that's not always possible. Well, and a lot of galleries, you know, hang salon style and there's a lot of stuff in the gallery. And um, a lot of my work is very quiet. And, yes, it is. It's very zen and quiet. That's what draws me to it. And because it's very quiet, it doesn't always show best in an environment where there's a lot of things around it. Uh, yeah. You know, it does better with a little bit of white space and a little bit of quiet. And I don't know. I mean, that's okay. I think that you know, people have to do what they do to make the retail aspects of it work. And some places maybe aren't the best fit for everyone. And that's just... Well, your work is very poetic, which, uh, you know, with you being a poet and everything, there's that relationship. And so let's, let's, let's switch and talk about your poetry a little bit. What is it that um, got you started in poetry and keeps you writing poetry? What, what do you, what would you attribute? Tribute that to, and you know, I I could talk about inspiration for hours, but um, let's just talk about your poetry for a minute. Well, I um, I've been writing poetry probably about as long as I've been painting. Um, I wrote poetry when I was a kid about all the sort of normal stuff, water oozles and birds in the in the river outside of our house and things about our family and those kinds of things. And I, I continue to write. I just um, published my book, Trial by Ordeal, in 2020. And it's most- Congratulations. Thank you. Well, I worked on it for about 10 years and- Sure. Like a really long time, but it took about that long. And um, I sent it out to about a hundred different places. I'm not kidding. It's like a lot of things, you know, submitting and trying things and revising and trying more things. And um, it went pretty well. Um, it came out and I, it's been weird to be doing it right now because there's so few events. So, you know, it's been good. I have distribution mostly locally at places like Atticus and Aunties and from here, Wishing Tree. Oops, here he comes. <laughs> Um, Wishing Tree um, at the Mac, um, in the gift shop at the Mac. Oh, good. And um, it's gone pretty, it's gone pretty good. Um, you know, you, nobody's going to get rich being a poet. And, um, but it's, it's been a good project. And Aww. I'm really happy with um, having done it. And I'm grateful that I was able to do it. Um, you know, not everyone has an opportunity to get their book published, right? Um, no. Um, I don't I, think people realize how um, how much um, you have to really involve your yourself and your, your psyche in order to, I mean, you think, oh, I'm going to write the poetry and that, but then the whole, you know, pulling it all together, getting it published, um, like you said, uh, sending it out. Um, there's a, there's a lot involved. Well, and just like with art, it's very competitive and, you know, and probably everyone listening to this thinks, well, you know, you just get a show. Well, you don't, um, you know, in 2019, I made it my goal to submit to a hundred things. And I submitted, um, exhibition proposals, to museums and regional art centers. I sent out poems. I sent public art proposals. I applied for art consulting rosters with state agencies around the region. And, you know, you do that enough and you realize that maybe you get, I don't know, 3%, 5% um, success. Sometimes you get a small success, like a gallery will take two or three pieces or something, and that may or may not actually lead to either any sales or any recognition. Um, so it's, it's a tough game, but, you know, I've been being pretty much working as a freelancer for the last eight years, and I've been able to pull it off to have some really great opportunities. And I've been able to make enough money to keep my household running, which is in and of itself a bit of a challenge. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's been good. 
No, people don't even realize that to donate a piece to a museum, it has to be vetted. You know, it's you can't just say, here, here's one of my pieces. They have to bring it before um, um, a panel and have it approved of before your work can be in, uh, included in, in a collection in a museum uh, or in a university. Um, I'll never forget, Karen, one of the things I just, I laugh because it was so spot on. But one of my art students said, you know, that she had she had signed up for my class because she wanted to know how to get into such and such an art gallery that I was in. And you said, you walk through the front door just like everybody else. <laughs> Is that what I said? Yeah, I'll never forget it. I went, yeah. <laughs> you know, I just went, have you signed up for my class? Because you thought I was going to be, it's not going to happen. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember saying that, but I well, it was years ago, but I remember the student and the look on her face. <laughs> well, it is, yeah, it's really challenging. I mean, then that is. things that is really important, I think, with this kind of work is to be really persistent. Yes. If you're too soft, um, it's too soft hearted or too thin skinned, thin -skinned you might right. not be able to pull it off because there is a lot of rejection. And then there's also a lot of silly stuff where people just don't understand what you're doing. You no, I could, I could, well, in fact, I am writing a book about some of that. <laughs> <laughs> this is just some of the things that people think are the way it is. I'm like, mm, that's not the way it is, you know? And, yeah. and there's, yeah, there's some, yeah, misnomers out there. But um, what I would like to do before we close, because it's, it's at the bottom of the hour is I would love to, um have you read one of your your poems for us okay I love going, your work. i'm going to read learning to turn which is a short poem and it has a little nod to matthew 5 at the seattle aquarium the blind rockfish learns to turn his head to see the veterinarian gave him anesthesia inserted a prosthetic, aesthetic, yellow glass eye. He needed an eye, not to see. He is still blind, but now he is more confident. He was bullied, picked on by fish, bigger, stronger, sullied, prodded, poked. He avoided his tank mates. He has learned to turn. We heard about the turned cheek, the looking away, the not acknowledging the notice. In this case, he turns and turns. He can see, he can't see, they leave him be. Amazing, that, you're just amazing. That's a true story about an actual fish. I wondered, wow, Karen, brilliant. Well, I'm I'm so enamored by your skills and talents and um, just you're such a great force for the community. You have truly made an impact and it's um, a legacy that I hope you realize that you've, in fact, I didn't get to read your bio and I'm gonna read it right now because people may not realize just the impact that you've made here. Karen is a working artist, poet and arts consultant. She is exhibited widely throughout the region including at Moses Lake Museum and Art Center, Spokane Public Library, Marmot Art Space, La Resistance, and other venues. Currently, she is working towards a three-person exhibit that you talked about at Turing Gallery with Rosemary Burrell and Deb Sheldon for April 2021. That'll be fabulous. She is active in Rotary 21 and serves as the co-chair of the International Service Committee and works to raise money to provide grants for potable water in rural areas of Africa and South America. She was named one of Spokesman Review's Difference Makers in Spokane for 2018 and was honored as a Spokane Citizen Hall of Fame inductee for the arts and letters in 2019. Her poetry book, Trial by Ordeal, was published by Resource Publications in 2020. So congratulations again, thank and you. thank you for all you do. Uh, you've made an impact, and I, um, I honor you for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So come back next week. Um, this will be posted uh, this coming Tuesday. And come back next week where I'm going to be interviewing Rachel Bade McMurphy, a fabulous jazz musician here in Spokane. And you're going to want to, 
you're going to want to meet her for sure. So have a great week and um, stay tuned. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.